Developed by D. Brad Talton Jr. and published by Level 99 Games, Mystic Empyrean runs at 228 pages long in a two-column format. It should be noted that there is an iPad app version of the game that includes a balance tool and searchable index. However, I will primarily stick to reviewing the hardcover version of the book for the purposes of this video. The game also requires a set of cards called a balance deck, but we'll get into that later. In Chapter 1, we get a basic overview of the game's setting and the principal characters you'll be playing as. Grand Corner stone, the crystalline root of a world called Empyrean, was shattered by a singularity event, scattering its pieces in all directions. This has resulted in a world with vast missing pieces filled with a kind of anti-existence force called Aether. The myriad splinters contain the literal seeds of the world and its ideas, waiting to be found in the form of lands, concepts, and paradigms. Finding and reawakening these cornerstone seeds is the job of the player characters known as Eidolon. As an Eidolon, you are granted powers and abilities from wearing your soul like a skin. In in other words, you literally are what you act, and your behaviors determine both power and appearance. Also included in this chapter is a brief rundown of terms and the major Eidolon factions. Each faction has its own advantages and playstyles that they emphasize, following a trinity of combat, puzzle, and social play. The first chapter serves as a lexicon introduction to the world, giving just enough information but still leaving plenty of gaps to be filled in later. Chapter 2 goes into the basics of how the game is played. Instead of using dice or a numeric formula, Mystic Empyrean uses a a concept called the balance, which is a measure of how the seven primary elements are skewed one way or the other. The balance is further divided into the world balance, which measures odds of success for a given action, and the personal balance, the elemental makeup of a given player or NPC, acting like core attributes in other games. The balance is typically represented with a deck of cards composed of nine elemental suits, but the game mentions glass beads and coins as potential alternatives. Additionally, Level 99 Games offers a balance deck, which I can definitely recommend if you're willing to spend $12 on it, as is composed of proper playing card stock. Further into the chapter gives a write-up of the seven primary elements and their great spirit as a potential NPC. The elements are as follows. Fire, light, electricity, water, stone, darkness, and air. Additionally, some detail is given on Aether and the anti eidolon spawned from it, known as Aetherlings. The chapter is rounded out with an introduction to the rotating GM structure that the game has, as well as advice on creating your first world book for your game. Chapter 3 delves into character creation. As I stated earlier, you are what you act in this game. How you play your character, from the judgment of the others at the table, will determine what abilities you have and will develop. This is done through the character's personal balance, persona traits, and appearance. For example, if I play a character who displays great bravery, I would gain and develop the persona trait Banneray, which allows me to rally enemies against an enemy more effectively. The more I play up this trait, the more powerful its effect would become. Additionally, since Banneray is a fire affinity persona trait, I would add more points of fire into my personal balance. On the other hand, the more powerful an effect it has, the less in control it is for me unless I shed the ability entirely. This improvement is done through a set of points called Emergence, which the other players will grant you each session based on how you acted in it, possibly even granting you new traits entirely. Every seven points of Emergence a Persona trait has, that trait's level increases by one, from base to superficial to D to all-consuming. It is expected that a starting character will have around four persona traits to start with, depending on the method of character creation. Each level of a persona trait adds 1 to 3 points to the personal balance of that trait's element, to a maximum of 5. It should be noted that all characters start with 1 point in pure anima, which cannot be expanded by persona traits. The final item of note with character creation is your character's creed. Creeds are the core, defining beliefs a character has, and may take the form of a statement such as, the guilty must be punished. Starting characters will have 3 creeds and a set of examples are given in the book. Creeds are made to be tested in this game, questioned through the collaborative storytelling and present dilemmas. Additionally, severely violating a creed can be devastating to the makeup of an Eidolon, given their nature. Chapter 4 covers gameplay in more detail, starting with the scene of the storytelling itself, called an encounter. An encounter is divided into four parts. 1. The context. A description of the situation by the player establishing the scene. 2. Establishing questions, wherein the players ask details in a round-robin manner about the scene itself. While the question is answered by the person who asked first, all questions are subject to the owner of that particular realm as a pseudo-GM. 3. Resolution. The actual play. In this step, the player who established the context becomes the GM, while the active player is the one to his or her left. Said player will declare his goal and draw from the balance to determine his success, while the GM narrates the results. After which, the active player role rotates to the next person. If the active player and the GM are the same person, then an escalation occurs, which generally complicates 
face the situation at hand. Once the encounter has reached the end of player's input, said encounter is considered closed. Four, closure. The encounter's epilogue of sorts. When the encounter has ended, the person who created the context should narrate a summary of what happens in the encounter's aftermath. Additionally, said person should determine the encounter's difficulty and the amount of emergence the players are awarded. It should be noted that the role of the GM may be potentially rotated, but it is not recommended in encounters where there is a set path or idea to follow. When resolving actions, the alignment of elements is paramount. The seven elements are arranged into a wheel which displays them in relative compatibility, and any given action you may undertake is tied to one of these elements. When you attempt an action that would dictate a chance of success or failure, you would draw from the world balance and compare the element drawn with the one your action is tied to. The closer it is on the element wheel, the greater of a success you've made. An element two steps away is a neutral success, i.e. you fail but you attain something advantageous. One step away is an outside success, you succeed but add a complication. A matching element is a perfect success, where you succeed extraordinarily. And an element on the opposite side is a failure, i.e. you fail extraordinarily. Additionally, the world balance may have pure anima or, or aether to draw, being an automatic success and an automatic failure respective. Where your personal balance comes into play is that you may redraw as many times as you have points in personal balance of that element. But a draw of aether will stop this cold. Tipping the scales in your favor is the anima surge, Mystic Empyrean's extra effort mechanic. At any given time, you may spend a point in your personal balance to force a success or ignore the effects of an aether draw. In doing so, the element you surged is added to the world's balance and you cannot gain that point until you've had a full day's rest. As mentioned before, escalations are an event that is triggered when the player and GM are the same person, or when the role of the GM is passed. Reflecting the dangerous nature of Empyrean, escalations shift fates and generally make things dramatically more complicated. When an escalation occurs, the GM draws two cards from the world balance and compares the element of the first with the second. In a perfect or outside success, the GM would check the escalation table and narrate its result into the encounter. Drawing an anima skips the escalation process entirely, while drawing aether magnifies it with a redraw. Mystic Empyrean favors a wound-based approach rather than using numeric help. In this system, wounds are split into the categories of superficial, deep, and heart. Superficial wounds are the marring of features, altering or disabling a persona trait at worst. Deep wounds affect a character's personal balance and may only be inflicted by attacks with emotional weight or by supernatural forces and artifacts. Heart wounds are the most potent, delivered by a supernatural force with emotional weight. Heart wounds can amplify, corrupt, or outright eliminate a persona trait in an Eidolon, turning it into the opposite of what it was. While persona traits can be powerful, they may grow too strong for the Eidolon's heart to manage. At any given time, an Eidolon can only maintain 10 ranks of traits and only one all-consuming trait. Any more than that may be shed into the form of Anima Pearls, which can serve as the foundation for artifacts called Wonders, or in some realms as currency. Chapter 5 deals with cornerstones and the realms within them. Specifically, this chapter deals with the system of realm creation. It is important to note that there is no real rule of consistency for what kind of setting a given world is supposed to have. Primitive tribes are just as liable realms as high-tech metropoli are. Creating a new realm is done in a series of steps to choose its traits. With the exception of civilization, each trait has an element associated with it which can be picked or drawn randomly. This method is how realms terrain, technology, wildlife, culture, and society are generated. Finally, you may spend 21 points across the seven primary elements to determine a realm's balance. Having more or less of an element may skew it towards a specific mode of beliefs, reflecting how the attitudes of that element are more or less pronounced. For example, a realm with a high light balance may have more formal and advanced classrooms and universities, or place an emphasis on proper education, while the opposite may place emphasis on more tribal education practices and oral traditions. Each element may have one to seven points each, and you may add one to three points of pure anima and one to three points of aether to skew the general difficulty or stakes of the realm. Rounding out the chapter is advice on including famous areas known as heritage sites, as well as advice for encounters to fill your realm in. Chapters 6 and 7 deal with paradigms and conceits, which are potential ideas and concepts that may be found in a given cornerstone instead of a realm. The primary difference is that of scale. Paradigms fundamentally change the way a realm works in some way, while conceits fundamentally change the Eidolon who unlocks it. Additionally, both are the primary means for an Eidolon to add pure anima to their personal balance, but additional benefits may range from the concept of currency, altering the terrain, to channeling the greater anima spirits. While I found the focus to be on new opportunities rather than boosting power, I think the line between the two is sometimes blurry. By that, I mean some paradigms come close to acting like conceits, and the difference between the two could have been better established.
established. Chapter 8 is the last primary chapter and is all about storytelling. In most games, this sort of thing amounts to an advice column. For more experienced gamers, since a lot of said advice repeats itself, the temptation is there to skip over this section. I think that the narrative focus and rotating GM makes this an exception to the rule. The chapter delves into the difference between more freeform and structured encounters and storytelling. In the latter case, providing options on how one can run a specific storyline someone wants to do without railroading the experience for everyone. The stronger point of the chapter is the scenarios, which provide the framework for potential storylines one can exploit based on the style of play the characters want to emphasize. Also included are the personal story arcs and the possibility of using Eidolons as a kind of astral projection in the modern world, eschewing the default setting of Empyrean entirely. Finally, a set of encounters is provided as framework for stories that emphasize the social puzzle combat trinity the game has. The first of the appendices that round out the book presents a sample world called Nitar, City of Steam. Nitar is a realm primarily composed of one city with a strong emphasis on steampunk fantasy in its design and tiers. Given the numerous factions and agendas vying for control of some aspect of the city, Nitar is inclined more towards social play than puzzle or combat. That said, I don't want to create the impression that a realm you make requires the level of detail that Nitar has. One can just as easily start simple and expand upon ideas as you develop. Personally, while Nitar is a great example, I think providing a few more examples of worlds that centered more on puzzles or combat might have helped demonstrate what the realm creation system is potentially capable of. While there are realm guide PDFs available on Level 99 Games' website, that is beyond the scope of this review. Nitar on its own is far from bad, but I think it doesn't show the game's full potential. The second appendix is a list of persona traits, of which there are 88 in total. While each trait is associated with an element, they are further categorized in the personalities, talents, virtues, vices, and drawbacks. While each trait is well defined across each level, I have a small nitpick in the way the groups are categorized. Under most circumstances, a persona trait's group does not matter unless suffering from a heart wound, where the opposite group is gained per its effects. Personality becomes talent and virtue becomes vice. I think that this section would be better served with the write-up on the common theme of, say, talents, and how they differentiate from the themes of other groups. But as I said, that's a minor nitpick. The third appendix is Wonders, the game's version of artifacts and magic items. The main advantage to a wonder is being able to utilize persona traits that have been lost without having their drawbacks or adding to the 10 rank limitation. The primary ingredients for crafting a wonder are an anima pearl, mastery of the appropriate technology, and, if the Eidolon wishes to craft it themselves, the crafting wonders conceit. Additionally, the currency paradigm allows Eidolons to buy and sell wonders as currency. Wonders are categorized into three tiers. Consumables, your potions and the like, minor, and major. The remaining segments amount to the character and realm sheets as well as some additional reference material. While each segment is well done, I'm not fond of having the character sheets being somewhere other than the last pages of the book. Furthermore, said sheets seem to appear out of order, with a dungeon encounter sheet right in the middle of the character and NPC sheet. The remaining segments are generators based on previous ideas mentioned in the book, rounded out by a series of player-created Eidolons and the Escalation Table. Overall, these materials in the back seem to be put together rather haphazardly, and feel like adding a few website bonus PDFs into the book's back. They're not bad on their own, but they could stand to be better organized. I won't lie, Mystic Empyrean has some elements that will not be for everyone. As a narrativist game, the enjoyment is going to live and die on people's ability to roleplay outside of their normal selves and play off of each other. The concept of a rotating GM is not going to be for everyone's cup of tea either. That said, the game's storytelling potential is vast and is an excellent multiversal game with a little bit of everything. The balance introduces a cool idea without needing to remake the wheel, and its core rules are easy to grasp. Mechanically, it offers simplicity without sacrificing characterization. I only have a few small nitpicks that I've outlined earlier, and while the art is great, I don't think it fully captures the setting's potential, nor some of the motifs like Aetherlings or Colossi. But other than those nitpicks, the game is very solid and has a lot of potential for storytelling in both small and large scale. Overall, I give Mystic Empyrean an 8 out of 10. <laughs>